is in developing a new theory for the origin of life. But perhaps uh, what I'll show you today is the, sort of the origin through documents, through the, the window of documents, the origin of maybe uh, what we could call a microcomputing revolution. So this is deep digital archaeology. So this is the barn, this is the digi barn there. For many of you who have been there, it's uh, nestled in the Redwood Forest in Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, it's had a lot of activity since we opened our doors in 2002. Uh, visitors, open houses, some of the rooms, it's very rough and ready. It's, it's kind of like a gigantic garage in a way. Uh, a lot of running systems. Uh, the focus really is capturing oral history, so getting the machines running is, is in part. This was Ed Phelan's uh, camp that he got running. Some odd balls. It's a bit of a few here, past and events. Uh, very uh, big focus on Xerox because I worked in the 80s on graphical interface software and we worked with Xerox Park and I was always the reason I started the Digi Barn was to tell the Xerox story because I felt it was underrepresented. And so here's a working 6085 uh, workstation, just a beautiful, beautiful environment. Still, uh, some more hot balls. That uh, environment in the lower right is, or on the right side is uh, the Blixer desktop, which I coded in the mid 80s uh, to have the Xerox look and feel running on DOS. It's very modern. Um, a lot of documentary films made there. William Shatner and Waz and whatnot, and here's one made by Arte in Germany just this last April, sort of shot that Galen uh, took from an interesting vantage point. Uh, there's me telling some of the Xerox story. Waz. Waz comes over when there's something weird to look at. Another kind of an odd, odd picture. So, but after collecting since 1987, uh, where the first machine that I collected was in a, it was a basically a brass calculator with a handle uh, at a yard sale in Sherman Oaks in Los Angeles, and I looked at this thing and fell in love with it. So this is the beginning of my obsession of disease, whatever. And one of the things that was interesting was, was a, there was a plane, a patent plate on it, and said patented 87. And this was 1987, I realized the first patent on this thing was filed in 1887. It's a hundred year old PC it was for. So I bought it. Fifteen dollars, you know, comptometer, Kelvin Terran comptometer, and that was item number one in the collection. That's that's where it all started. But after all that time, it was time to reboot the Digi Barn. And this is the story of phase one of the rebooting of the Digi Barn, which is the re, uh, this resorting of all the artifacts. So, kind people like yourselves and many others over the years have sent in a huge number of donations. This is what happens here in this museum as well. And there comes a time when it just gets to critical mass and you realize you have far too much cardboard. And it's potentially a fire hazard, and you really need to do a better job of sorting things out. So this, these are some of the shots of working since January with uh, my friend and neighbor Steve Shoemaker, who's to be sitting here somewhere. He was me embarrass him, uh, but then we basically went through everything. There is me in one of the rooms trying to sort out Apple history. There we are at our work table. Our furious pace of every artifact was, was examined, things were a little dusty, they got cleaned, they got sorted out, they got put into where they should be with their nestled amongst their neighbors in computer history. There's another view. You know, just you can sort of see, you know, we're trying to figure out is, does Tarbell Basic go here when Tarbell Basic was used over here? You know, this is a, this is an kind of issue. So it literally, my little brain was blown in this entire history for months of what goes with what. Sometimes it goes with both. Another view. So what I decided to do as we were going along is I just took my phone out and there's something really grabbed me. I took pictures and I shared them on Facebook just to get interested in the community and this is computer history being unraveled. And I, I, in a 
since uh, as, as having done all this, I realized, oh, there's kind of a talk in here because this stuff is really interesting and it's in a unique stream that perhaps you'll never see again. Uh, this is the uncovering or the, ar the archaeological day, if you will. So this is, this is in 10 sections. First one is, and I'll go through these quite quickly, the roots of the microcomputer, or you just can't believe what these guys put up with. So here we have, you know, for everybody's seen this, the, the Altair farm, <coughs> Opera Electronics. But nobody, just people knew about this. Before you had Altair 8800s, you had uh, Mint uh, putting out the electronic calculator kits, and this is one of them, this is 1972. And it's like, why would you want to do this? But there were people who to make a calculator from basic parts from a kit. And here's your, your bags, uh, your parts. And here's uh, your guide as to how there's all the, uh, the display tubes. And putting together your 1440 calculator, this is the part of its business. So they, they came by this honestly, let's put it that way. Now here's something, when I pulled out, I realized, oh, this is wonderful, this is sweet. This is copy you know, version number one of the Altair computer system, theory of operations. That old schematic's really sweet, 1975. Probably you know, spring of '75, really early stuff. And what I loved about this is this is this introduces uh, you know let's talk about the Altair 8800. Here's the front panel schematic, uh, CPU buffers. But introducing what this thing is, this, you know, recent advances in the semiconductor have made possible the, the most economic computer ever. Made available both kit form, we know all about all that, but then what it does is it, it introduces to you a George Boole. Right? So, this is in a way manual number one for microcomputers, like what Boole system of logic, because it's all going to start from scratch. You're going to be running the same through the front panel through the switches. So, they do a pretty good job of this. You know, here's, here's, here's a Boolean logic, here's all what it is. Tables, this and this. You really have to know this thing. You're getting your your Altair 800 in the mail, etc., etc. The binary system. You know what that is. And computer programming. What is that? Um, so you know, it's basically what a computer program is. So let's make a simple program. Here's your retrieve numbers, your memory locations, add them, back up, and then introducing the concept of an instruction for each one of those things. <coughs> and here's loading your program. And of course, on the Altair 8800, what that means is here's your, your bit pattern, your switch locations on the front of the system. Program. Now, uh, here's the software agreement that's kind of interesting because uh, I think it says uh, you know, liable and open for MIPS to take legal action against you, etc. They were trying to do that thing, you know, that, uh, and this is possibly just as Bill Gates and Paul Allen are getting started. Uh, they did? Uh, huh? <laughs> right. Uh, now, what was interesting in here was this listing, MIPS Programming System 1. I, I didn't know much about this. And, and here it is. It's the system to uh, run the machine. And here's the bootstrap. And that's to run the cassette interface. Pretty cool. Uh, first, Altair Basic. This is Microsoft's product number one. Here's MIPS Altair Basic. Costs about as much as the freaking machine. I wonder if you can copy the paper tapes. So here's, I love these 70s fonts, you know. They didn't have word processors at the time. So here's, here's the introduction, etc. Et et Before a computer can perform any useful function, it must be told what to do. Told what to do. English or any other human language. Et cetera. So it's telling you what a programming language is. Of course, this becomes Microsoft's business later. There's a early utility manual, and here's of course the wonderful Worms spaghetti font version of Microsoft's early basic 80. This is a reference that come out of Albuquerque. 
And along with this, you get this tremendous explosion of people forget how big of an effect events actually have. They had their own convention, they had a bus that went around. They had the Hyatt Rickies things, right? You can get the Hyatt Rickies for the bits, the whack and everything. This huge. Girls' first computer store. I didn't know this was in uh, South San Diego freeway. I thought it was the bike shop, but no, this is the first computer store here. Altair Convention. There's Dave Bunnell's story about the first Altair Convention. And all the contests for the best programs were run by Bill Gates. And so you see these articles like, best program is like four instructions. Bill Gates is saying, why this was the program of the contest? So this article was written by Bill Gates for the WAC uh, Grand Prize winner. And then Computer Notes, which is their kind of journal that went on for several years until they're, they're, uh, they went out of business. There's a really cool graphic here. And then this spawn, of course, we know the home group club, and Web knows it, knows it well. Uh, it spawned many other user groups like the home group computer club. Here's a, I think it's newsletter number one. Uh, it's a hobby. There's Wayne Green, you'll see him later. Uh, here's another club newsletter, 75. Here's a great cover. Is that Lee on the bottom, I think? There was a reasonable cartoonist in the club that was drawing members. It was called in 75. I think that was the second newsletter uh, in member. It was kind of interesting. Of course, it's all shaggy, shaggy guys, right? <laughs> so there were other clubs. So here's Northwest Computer News, and they would feature on the cover of somebody with their system. So here's a couple of fellows with Dave Sampson with the Altair system. You were proud. Kind of like a Female models with sports cars, but the, uh, the nerd version. <laughs> and the occasional cartoon. However, the user of this package should be careful not to hit backspace in this Or another convenient feature of this terminal is the ability to do page injection. So, two, this brings us to, you know, we heard about the brilliant talk this morning about CPM and its potential influence on DOS. <coughs> But CPM, yeah, there are some uh, some documents that popped out here. So here's a, uh, uh, a uh, letter for digital research customer. These, these listings are included are proprietary and must be protected by the customer from its copying and abstraction. So it's up to Bob Seidemann was uh, researching at the talk this morning. So that's the that's the letter you get if you got the listing of CPM yeah, source code. Here's the food part of it. And uh, here's just a, a, a cover here of the assembler for the assembler. 1976 stamp. Bob was describing on the novel's listings these stamps kind of included the source code. And you had to guess what was under the source code. This jam. And what I love about this is look at this. Gordon Eubanks, of course, who is one of the primary uh, programmers for. Uh, for digital research, and here it's still listed at the U.S. Navy Postgraduate School, Monterey, California. That's cool. So that's, that's pretty early. This is the, the basic need. And here's another listing that's all sort of marked up by, probably not by DRI, but maybe was, I don't know. You could ask uh, Bob. So here's some early literature marketing CPM, low cost microcomputer software, digital research. This is a grow. Super Max, this is their, their assembler. And one of the very early and successful programs was uh, WordStar, written by Rob Barnaby. Um, I think while he was at, at MSI, this is the WordStar 1.0 source that he donated to the Digimar. And this was actually, so here's a piece of it here. And it was written on this M side. So this is the very, very machine that uh, Rob Arnaby told a worst star on. It's a very funny looking M side with a little built in small screen. And these floppies, which have a big sign on them that says, Do, uh, Warning. If you power up the machine with floppy and just drive it, formats it. It's a feature. Not a 
So coming in at three, uh, so as the industry is maturing and growing, we get books. And uh, the books we publish this uh, microcommuting thing is a real thing. And some of the books that came out of our resorting were included a uh, way three. Uh, hobby computers are here. Uh, this is not really a very well known book, but it was uh, sort of beautifully written. Computers are here, are you ready? And here's uh, what he means by that. Uh, what is a computer? Uh, it's the early days of the What is a digital computer? And of course, you know, there's a, the pan here for the small wonder of the Microsoft Altair 8680, which was their sort of mini, mini version of the big Altair. And this is one of the greatest uh, books ever for microcomputing in Revolution, the TV typewriter cookbook by Don Lancaster. And uh, people who are actually in the know, including Daniel Kotke, have told me that if you look at the Apple One, it's just a TV typewriter with a broad microprocessor on it. <laughs> so, in a sense, this is a, a tap root of, of what microcomputing is, a particular book. <coughs> So here is the first edition, 1976, and this is what you're building. You're building something such that you can type on it, and so you'll see the text on the TV. Uh, this is a, the second book uh, by Don Lancaster, which is really quite tongue-in-cheek and funny, uh, The Incredible Secret Money Machine. This book was signed by Don at some point, and somebody And find out how I made money. Send five dollars and ninety-five cents to. Right, this is how you did it. Right, it's called the bootstrapping method of funding, uh, you know, microcomputer companies. So just like send us the money. Do you remember the spear ads at the second edition of Fight? It's a great big, complete red uh, page of red with white text on it, which was send send in four hundred dollars by September thirtieth, and you'll get your spear system. The Sphere had no funding at all. It was just totally bootstrapped by this app <laughs> trying to uh, get the Sphere. I don't know if the ever produced money. They, they, they kind of initiated this bootstrap idea send it by certain, send your money by certain date. So, this is another great one by uh, Bob Albrecht, who later is uh, known as Dragon Smoke and he was computer company and all that. I uh, just love this book. Uh, this probably, I guess, is produced for the People's Computer Company Center in Menlo Park, or probably around that time, probably, probably Landos or somebody does. My computer likes me when I speak in Google. So it's just beautifully done, it's beautifully put together. What is a go to statement? It's sort of very visual. This is the era of computer lib, it's from the case notebooks. And, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, admonishment experiment. Get punched in the eye too. You know? So meanwhile, there's a real world out there. The big, big world is happening. All these hobbyists are doing their thing at places like MIT, SRI, the ARPANET, and that's our spark. And let's take a look at some of the artifacts that came out. So the big project we did for the last BCF West was the restoration of the link with the original link team, and they all came out and. It wanted us to show uh, BCF 10 in 2007. So here it sits in the room, it's still movable. Uh, fortunately, uh, Wes Clark, the designer of the system, passed away in February. So we did a number of things to honor him. But uh, one, of, one other thing that happened was because of the work at the BCF 10 with the Computer History Museum on the link restoration, it kind of uh, alerted the world to the fact of what the link was, since the first personal work state, how seminal it was, how important it was. And so Washington University commissioned a custom display of the link, where the link project ended up after it left MIT. And uh, then the museum in Pottermore, Germany, the Heinz Nixdorf Museum, got in touch with me and other link project members a year and a half ago wanting to involve Mary Allen Wilkes in their display on women in computing. And they have seen Mary Allen in a video shot in this room in 2007 where she's talking about writing the operating system for the link at home in her parents' house in Baltimore. The first time the computer was used in 
private residence. You know, it's an amazing thing. And Mary Alice served on his own here. I saw the video shot at the VCO, and they wanted to include her. And there she is in Pottaborn. They flew the whole team over there. They flew a link over there, and they honored uh, Mary Ellen Wills for her role as the king. It's a wonderful product of the VCM, so I would like to thank everybody here. So there's uh, Mary Ellen, the uh, older and younger in the pictures. And here's the link that was shipped over from St. Louis uh, for, that, for that project. And here is Mary Ellen and Wes Clark. And this is, uh, Wes uh, traveled there in September of last year, and he passed away in February. So this is a, a wonderful tribute to both of them, especially to Wes, to see that, that their work has been really recognized. So let's pop on over to SRI. Here's uh, Bill English at SRI using the mice on the uh, NLS system, the mouse and the key set. And uh, this is Don Nielsen, who was was part of the SRI team in a, in a big way for many decades. And here's some of the early uh, systems, the early versions of NLS. And one of the things that came from Digi Barn two years ago through John Gilmore is this key set and mouse from uh, Dr. Latin. And I learned later that there were match set and that you can see the same cabling that was later cabling added to these are originals, but to go to something called the line sequencer, which was added about 1970. So it's really wonderful that it's a match set. And of course, here is the, uh, here's what it looks like underneath. And I was at Bob Taylor's Tomato Fest, uh, I think last year, brought this, this set, and there's no English there. And Bill grabbed, he grabbed the mouse, and he said, the diameter of that wheel is set so that when I move my hand to its maximum extent of my arm, it will cover the area that, um, where, where the screen was. So that's the diameter of that, the, the, the two tracking wheels. And he took the key set, and he wasn't even looking at it, and he just started typing on the key set. I think he was the fastest human on the key set, on the core key set. So it was a wonderful kind of a computer history come alive again. So one of the things Bob Don Nielsen brought over one day was this. This is a packet radio from the original SRI uh, packet radio uh, experiments with sending, basically taking the LO network idea, making a, a kind of a wireless internet. So it, most of these were supposed to have been sent back to the Navy, and there was like a few of them hanging around. So he brought one over. It's just a wonderful thing to have in the collection. And this leads on to the ARPANET. Uh, I mentioned Bob Taylor was the real, real initiator of the ARPANET, so right off the door. Uh, but here's a couple of things that came actually uh, through our web, uh, things that were just sort of extras. This is ARPANET directory 1977 uh, from the Network Information Center at SRI. And of course, I can look up there's Bob Taylor, and this directory lists everyone who's on the ARPANET, their home institutions. And, how to reach them by phone and whatnot. Let's think like everybody that has an account in the ARPANET that does not might not be working, right? <laughs> so here's the uh, geographic map in 1977 showing all the hosts at the time. And this was uh, sent to this gentleman at, at BBN. This is really a beautiful little artifact that sort of captures a moment in the time of the, the ARPANET. And then we jump over to one of my favorite places, Xerox Park, where uh, in, of course, the mid-70s, they were doing things like this, allowing anybody who came through the revolving doors and the only alto, figure out how to do windows and icons and, and run a bit down display and create a, an architecture for information. This is the famous shot from the LLK Scientific American article. 1977 showing kids using the Alto. It's always an important thing in part that it should be usable by uh, my kids. And here's a great shot of uh, an Alto screen at the Living Computer Museum, who are here today, have just done a restoration of two Altos. They have that work together. It's awesome. You should see what those folks have done. It's a dream come true for any of us who are fans of Xerox Park. So, congratulations. I don't know if they can run Cedar or anything like this, but uh, 
I just love these piggies because they look like the fishy barns and that's got them done. Or the piggies with the one that's other out still screen. And of course, Maze War, which we did a project here in 2004 at the BCF, restoring Maze War on the original MLAC and then running from the monitor if any of you were there. This base war was just profoundly fascinating. It was a 3D shooter, first person shooter, that ran over the ARPANET in the 70s and then on many systems since. And it was a very powerful theme, so that's why we did base war in the 30s. So we have an auto emulator in the corner running base war. You have an auto emulator in the corner running base war. Awesome. Okay. Fantastic. Everybody go over there after this. So here's some other rare stuff from the park. As far as I know, there were not really any pictures taken of this until this Rob Q donated this uh, personal uh, photograph album. This is the demo, the mother of all demos for park. It was done in, ironically, Boca Raton, a virtual home of the IBM PC. This is where the park people brought it. All these outdoors, and they made an office environment to show to the Xerox executives who didn't have a clue, didn't understand what they were looking at. Their wives, because the were mostly men, uh, got all excited, but they didn't have a clue. So, this is called Make the Alto Real. This is pivotal because these are the people who basically invented the world we all live in, trying to get their own corporation to understand what they've done, and they couldn't. And so people like Chuck Cassidy and John Warner said, We're, we don't know what to do. And then Peter McCulloch said, well, then leave and found your own company. And they, they got Adobe and, you know, wow. So this was a, a, quite an event. So these people were very excited that they were going to try to finally make the Alto real. There's some pictures from that. It was, they're just all real charged up, you can tell, because of all this coffee, probably, and coffee 76. Spirit of Interdependence. <laughs> I don't know what this was. Uh, and then uh, through Bob Mills, who actually is going to be interviewed in the oral history program later this month, uh, I met him a few months ago. These uh, came, Bob actually wrote these, some of the software that grow ears and could drive, drive the person to the laser printers at, at, uh, at Park. So here's some of the code. Uh, this is Alpha 2 Orbit, Dover, etc. Uh, on a file printer. He, Bob went on to actually be the partner manager of the shipping of the uh, Macintosh. He was the adult <laughs> that Apple to make sure the Macintosh was manufactured. So watch for his oral history, it's going to be this fantastic. So here's uh, Ethernet, uh, distributed uh, packet switching for local area next by Apple Box. That sort of grew out of that SRI project on the packet radio. There's an article about Hub. So that's what's going on in the real world of adults. Adults are doing sort of things. But back in the garage, we still see you know, the handiwork of the genius uh, homebrew movement. So this is actually it's some artifacts from Bob Delton that were donated. Is that says that Mexico? And a calculator project, so don't make your own calculators. There's a real oscilloscope. You know, just interesting things like this is from Apple from his time at Apple, but these are all the people who looked at whatever was in this Noah envelope. Uh, Apple clock and RAM project. And here's some shipment of uh, some test CPUs, you know, new product introductions, etc. This all came through Bob Delville. And then, of course, we come to the point where microcomputers are growing up, hobbyists begin business. And this is a really cool artifact, an ephemeral artifact from the collection that was sent to me by Stan Pete, published computer shopper here, computer shopper. So Stan Pete, uh, I think he's probably one of the people, shakers and movers behind PC 76. PC 76 in Atlantic City in August of 76 kind of was the first show before West Coast Computer. And this is the t shirt from that, so maybe this is the first t shirt for a microcomputer. And uh, he was wearing this shirt and standing next to. 
free shiny dice which are on the table when Sam reached for them to get a free table, they would come out and show their new thing called the Apple Wall. And so there's Jobs, Kopke, and uh, Wozniak there. That famous picture where they have the, the RCA full wood veneer television and they have their Apple One. That's at the table that Stan gave them. And the t shirt sort of harkens back to that. So at the DCF in 2006, when we did Apple in the Garage here in the museum, uh, I wore this shirt. And Boz and uh, Daniel signed it. And a uh, really nice, uh, Steve Jobs actually sent a really nice note to Daniel Kopke wishing us well for the 30th anniversary event, which he often wasn't that interested in computer history, but we got his blessing, which was very nice. So there it is, Replicating 76. Boz and uh, Daniel Kopke, who should be here again, is. And then rolling forward, of course, uh, the Oprah Computer Club seeing, oh, look at all these shows that are going on. Uh, why don't we have our own here in the hall of the birthplace of microcomputing? And so this was born the West Coast Computer Fair, and this is the original uh, proceedings. It's costing, that's a lot of money, $12, or if you prefer, a nickel more than eleven ninety five. <laughs> and there you can see microcomputers, there's a, there's a cable car there, Eight bit, XRAM, whatever, so that's sort of logo art. And of course, there's ads in here. There's a bite. Uh, we're different. No ads, no frills. It's all content. Here's the cares, Bob Elric. Uh, you should subscribe to Creative Computing. Here's the reasons. One, two, I wonder if these are copyright. These are reasons. And this is a preface in introducing uh, what the fair and it's racing along at such a pace that they make my, uh, my over 50 eyes are just I can't read that. There are the three uh, voters and takers behind the WCC and Jim Horn, of course, uh, Rob Riley and uh, Rick Lindsky, uh, Wandering Minstrel. Now, I think Jim was the one who used the roller skate, right? He would have been using a segue in our time to go around the exhibit more. And some of the articles, I mean, they have proceedings, for goodness sakes. Fred Cole, robots you can make for fun and profit. And here's some of the exhibitors, and we see Apple Computer there on uh, Stephen Street Boulevard. What they had done was, uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so here's the uh, program, and this is the bottom floor of the old Civic Center, which is now torn down. Place it with Moscone. Apple had the front two, like the front teeth, like the uh, incisors. Uh, as the, you came in the door, they had those two booths right there. And this Steve Jobs marketing uh, genius. It says, you walk in, they just saw Apple. This is what you saw. So, rolling along here, um, seven. Now, of course, we think, you know, Apple was the first nicely packaged PC. It wasn't. In fact, Apple got going because of the Solid 20 and the processor tech and the Elsenstein's design. Because it, they sold about 10,000 of these in 1976 and the 77, and then finally, you know, Waz and John were like, we have to get going. We're going to lose the market. People also don't realize that, you know, Bill Gates and Paul Allen left his college and went to Albuquerque to write the language for the Altair because they thought they were too late already. Like someone else is going to take over the languages business. You know? I think, in the sense of the entrepreneur, talking about the entrepreneur program, these people who think that others are racing towards something, and so they're hyper motivated to get there first, and they do, but sometimes too early. <laughs> um, but the salt money was interesting because, you know, this is what you had to deal with if you wanted a person here at home. So, is it a selfie or is it a go mark, mark one? What you had to, this is what you expected to be able to build. And this is how you expected to build it. This is the individual parts. So, you know, it's easy, right? Here's, all your, here's your bags of parts. What's the problem? This is long as you get this exactly right location for proper solder. So this is, this is you know, trivial stuff. It shouldn't be a problem on your computer. You had to kind of know this stuff. And then these boards started coming out that were prepackaged and made it a little less painful. Here's 
still God bound, still coming in the market. Lots of God bound products which we can come to grow later. But then you had this Saul, named after Les Solomon, being, I think, the publisher of some other electronics, or is like you had to name it after him and name the preacher. Yeah. And then, now, of course, this is the only Saul that I've ever seen that had a built in set. It was sort of a prototype concept model, kind of like the light. Now, very I don't know if ever seen that, that was lost in the mail or something. Uh, but they didn't even know what to call it. So they call it an intelligent computer terminal. Why? Because it had a built in keyboard, had a brain, and it could do things that a terminal could do. It looked and felt like a terminal, the keys felt like a real computer terminal, right? So they didn't even have the word PC. Microcomputer, whatever. Intelligent term, you know, why not? Trying to, it's like horseless carriage right, for automobiles. It doesn't quite know how to go from the old to the new. So here's a really nice select manual. You could, you could use that as a seat cushion on this. And uh, Lee donated this some years ago. I think this was their, their terminology. Take the obvious and simplify it. So the first complete small computer. It's pretty nice, nice advertisement. It's a year for right? So of course the other main driver, you know, what we're talking about, which was the main driver, is God Game, the real killer app. And here's a few that came out of the boxes of Apple Castle Wolfenstein. Take a look, you know, how to use your controllers, production. Find you super super low res, super low res graphics. In these in these days, definitely the hand drawn art was far more impressive than the game. The main thing is that it's flipped now. And remember Zork One? There's the tips, <coughs> adventure tips and solution for Zork One with Steve Tippett. Here we go. What is it? It's an adventure game. You type text and it tells you where you are and where you might go next. And here's Zork 2, we got a little slicker when we got Zork 2. And our tips and solutions for adventure games. And uh, Adventures in Adventuring, basically another adventure by Ken Rose. They just kept multiplying. Return of the Ted Eye. <laughs> Star Wars in Adventures in Adventuring, another Ken Rose title. With a, with a kind of a map of where, where you're going. And this is one of my favorites, Micro Chess by Peter Jennings. The first chess program for micro computers, and actually one of the best selling early micro computer games. And I know that the first exhibits done here at the museum was about chess and computers, so this was a featured part of it. One of the things that Peter donated was a, a cassette saying, This is the only copy of Micro Chess. Cassette. In a safe place. So here's a bit of a player's game of the micro chess. And I just love this. I think that this is like Pac Man, Pac Man porn art or something. I don't know, I can't figure out what this is. It looks like Pac Man or Pac Man. Any, anyone's guess? Southern California stuff. So here we come to Big Kahuna, Enter Apple. It's all in a packaging. So here's our packaging. The only problem with this packaging was Quaz had invented a floppy drive over the spring of 77, 78, and, uh, but there was no operating system. Nobody in the company knew how to write operating systems. So they couldn't go from cassette to this thing called the floppy disk, running this wonderful, beautiful uh, two drive controller was and invented until this man came into the picture who you're going to hear from after me, Paul Lott, who's now a uh, docent here at the museum. There's Paul sitting with his listings of the Apple II DOS first and last delivery, 1978, uh, just after we did the Oregon History a year or two ago, a couple of years ago here. And here's some of the listings, which were scanned in by a great team here, as you heard from Bob earlier this morning, same kind of thing. OCR failed, had to be retyped, uh, preserved, and then Various uh, maneuvers made to get Apple's permission to uh, publish this and allow, allow the community to have access to it. Thanks to Lynch, who's second to uh, 
Mike Markle and Steve Wozniak are helping us to do that. And there's a, I like this uh, comment, uh, get off code, go find out how long. Get how long, if it ain't free, then don't reload. Oh, that's good to get a brief comment for you. But with this donation from uh, Paul Lawton were copies of the letters between Shepherds and Microsystems uh, and Apple about the contract. So this is literally the contract. There's a subsequent letter that has the words contract typed into it as the post contract, but this is the letter requesting a, an operating system for the Apple II. File manager, basic interface, utilities, etc., for a total uh, cost of thirteen thousand dollars in nineteen seventy-eight. And the, the date on this is April tenth. Paul delivers the code on July June sixth. Incredible! And what they had, what Paul did, is on a national semi machine used the final card interface to do the initial coding on the 6502 emulator, wrapped it out to paper tape, went to the Apple II to a custom made paper tape reader that was in me, load it to the Apple II to then figure out if we could talk to the fly drives. And they did this over and over and over again. And Paul, and you'll, you'll hear from him later, would have done microcode for IBM timeshare systems and whatever. And because this is such an effective coder to make a small uh, OS, you wouldn't even call this an OS, it was like an operating environment, but very compact code. And so this is some of, this is either Waz's or Paul's notes on reading and writing the floppy. This is Waz's bootloader that he had relocated there, and if you'll notice it says on, on the right, must not cross page boundary, must not cross page boundary, that's an extra instruction. Right, so you save every instruction you can. So this is a, the boot right. And here's Bill Fernandez's layout for the controller, for the actual control. This is from uh, January, early January of 78. And, uh, and so sort of timing. And this, the sector formatting for the Apple II is yeah, pretty cool stuff. And I think with the restoration and publication of all these documents, this is 2013, it was like a fantastic example of digital archaeology because we have the source code for the Apple II DOS. It builds the binary and it works. You can take the source code for DOS 3.3, which shipped, disassemble it, compare it line by line with the all on delivered code with the comments in it. And you have perfect reconstruction of the Apple II DOS project. So rolling on, there's some more Apple. Here's the schematics uh, for the uh, parallel printer interface. Schematic. Uh, this is the, for the serial card, super serial card. Here's some early Apple software, of course, a long cassette for the Apple II. Alignment test film. Star Trek. Infinite number of monkeys. This is a really interesting uh, donation that came in. I looked at it and I said, this tells a whole story. In fact, this is up on the wall at the startup gallery at the, the Albuquerque Museum. It talks about NITS. Because here you have it all here. Here you have Microsoft's basic stamped in Albuquerque, mastered, made by Bill Gates, and sent to Apple which then stamps it as Applesoft Basic and ships it out. You know, this is before the Basic was built in. This is just a wonderful capturing of the relationship with the two companies. And I talked to somebody at, uh, at Apple at this time, they said, yeah, if you called Apple at this time, Steve Jobs would pick up the phone. If you called Microsoft, Bill Gates would pick up the phone. <laughs> so here's a early learning software, just two, the Apple II. Here's some fileware for the Lisa, uh, when the Lisa had floppies, bigger floppies. And here's some interesting things, just get labels, you know, there's the kind of thing that just gets thrown away, you know, here they are. And a wonderful Alice in Wonderland rendition uh, gave through the looking glass, you know, beautifully packaged for, for the Macintosh, I think it's the Macintosh. Yes. And this was interesting, I'm not sure if this came for you, Bill or somebody. No, this is actually came from Bob Bill. This is the draft for Apple Talk. These are internal documents. Trying to do 
not distribute we're doing today. Apple Talk, which along with it, we did the schematics for Apple Bus, Apple Bus, Apple Bus Link Access Protocol Specification, 1984. Hardware overview, cabling. We're going to have the cables coming off and be specified. Topology. I like this our internets and bridges. Before the term internet, it was the connection of networks. What internet really means. And a wonderful article in Byte by Wall, it's a Sweet 16, the Green Machine. And we actually, through a donation from Bill Goldberg here, uh, the Boz Wonder Book resurfaced. It was all of Boz's notes uh, that led to the Red Book. So that was a project about eight, nine years ago. We scanned all that in. It was very faded. And a fellow in New Mexico actually redrew all of Boz's hand drawn schematics. When we did our Apple at 30 birthday party right here in this room, I came up to Boz and I presented him this manual that had restored Wonder Book. And he looked in and he saw Sweet 16. And he teared up. He teared up. He said, I haven't seen this in 30 some years. And he said, Can I have this? I said, We did this for you. <laughs> we are taking the Wasp Wonder Book resurfacing. So there's Sweet 16, 16 bit environment. Oops. Uh, I'm going to order your Apple II now. And here's Wasp's signature on an Apple II GS, the last machine he designed at Apple. 20 years after the machine shipped, and the signature really hasn't changed a bit. You know, it's just an amazing thing. <coughs> this is a, a very interesting thing that came in through Bill again, Brooklyn. And this was a machine that Apple never, never shipped. It was designed to run multiple processors and multiple operating systems. And there were a number of projects at the time that all had bridge names, like Golden Gate and Brooklyn, which were supposed to bridge between errors between OSs and technologies. And here's some of the microprocessors, the prototype 16-bit 6502. And this is coming from this uh, product uh, from this Western Design Center. The proposal for the definition of the enhanced Apple IIe program. And yeah. Oh, so this is from Service Engineering, uh, sent to Bill Goldberg. Some of those. And what I find, what I love about this stuff is the down and dirty bowels of these companies trying to support their customers. And the documentation from this is often never checked, but it really is telling about the history and day to day life of companies. So here's a, a card test of uh, this gap, or the XC Apple 3 could have been Apple 2. And here's some code to uh, run some tests somewhere. Here's some notes, which test only text to pull up, pull down. Recognize that? He's not, he's blinking. That's your handwriting, yeah. And then on to some more Apple internal stuff. Soft drinks and software, John Scully arrives. Uh, East EOS starts a revolution. I don't know if I'd ever want to be face to face with the guy on the right, would you? There is practicing. I think this is just before uh, when uh, Steve was on, on the board for another two years. Apple's dynamic duo, Apple's comeback. Apple's always making comebacks, right? He said that it came back and took over everything in the last round. The Bandly Shuffle. Anybody remember the Bandly Shuffle? There they are. And this wonderful, beautiful, wonderful little thing. Does anyone know what this is? Raise your hand. It's a really rare thing. This is the original logotype design icon mascot for the Macintosh, designed by the artist Malone for Steve Jobs. This is 1983, and if you actually, um, it, it didn't, he didn't get used, sort of a Mr. Macintosh, the pin. And actually, if you look on the some of the wire wrap boards, early PCBs with the Macintosh, you'll see a little man in the Macintosh. Oops. That was kind of another logo for the Mac. And of course, the Macintosh logo is just Macintosh, you know, in its in the time to run. So, leading on from this, here's a whole bunch of uh, on a Macintosh blanket. Here's a bunch of badges and buttons. 
support the revolution. Hypercar. And uh, I don't know what this was about. Apple, Apple now, what happening? Screw job. Somebody put on I'll put your mind at ease. Most, most personal computer, Apple IIe. Celebration. Various uh, user groups. Yes, it's back. And what this refers to. Shipping. That's a bill. That's a bill. Bob Taylor quote, uh, I think, is it? Shipping. Apple service is a, is a business. Original needs. Apple Two Forever. Yes. And leading on to, you know, out of the Apple Two era, we can't have the lease era. There's a faceplate for this was a Lisa that was donated that was halfway between the tweeze being pulled out and the three and a half inch floppy being put in and this was donated to the museum so it's a service engineering model and I've got spare tweeze drives so you need to there's Lisa. This is fascinating. This uh, is the original documentation for the Lisa pre alpha of it. So it's the first draft of the Lisa on first copy. And that's, that's from a, a slide presentation. But take a look at this. There were hand drawn figures, really quite nicely done uh, in this in this pre alpha draft. And of course, Lisa died at horrible death. Uh, this is not an encouraging thing to have on your magazine cover that you know, you're leasing your users. And we go into the Macintosh era. And this is a fascinating artifact, and this is also here on the museum online. Thanks to Daniel Crosby for preserving this. The preliminary Macintosh business plan, 12th of July, 1981. They didn't have an idea that IBM was coming out with it. You see, they had chess and quotes. I think that was the code name for the PC. But this was built as though it looked like pull down menus. Because why? Because Steam wanted the business plan to look like the interface of the machine. The bill. And so Johanna Hoffman and a friend of Mark, who might be in the audience here, realized I can't make something that looks like this on an Apple III with a Dominator's printer. I need to go and go into Park where they have a machine like this and write the business plan in Bravo X or whatever it was and I'll print them out there in the middle of the night when nobody's around and take them back to Apple. So they use Park resources to write the business plan for the Macintosh and Lisa, you know, in the secret, printing it up at Dover or the very end desk. Okay, let's get out of the building before the employees arrive and, and uh, present them to Steve. And Steve never knew this. But, so this is, this is all done on the Nelta. Right, so talk about links between, between uh, you can talk, you can call this a bit of infringement. Uh, so there's some screen size comparison of the Lisa, the Macintosh, etc. And here's kind of interesting positioning, you know, here's the most successful computer in the world bears fruit, and this is the course in 1981, and uh, which is the successful uh, business tool for the 80s, the Lisa, which it wasn't, and its younger brother, which wasn't the business tool, really, in the 80s. And here's uh, the, the odd organization chart from 81, and this, you'll notice this is also telling, you know, there's Steve Jobs at head of it in marketing, he's acting, there's Daniel down there. Uh, you'll also notice the uh, hubs of uh, Jeff Raskin. This is just before Jeff Raskin was kind of pushed out of the company. And on the last page, it's the uh, oh, well, Apple now is Apple. You know, it's time, you know, dropping our reverse involves from the commercials of the day. And then here it is coming out. Here's the back of the out. Perfectly preserved brochure. These were, I think, in time or this week in December of 83. These things were just inserts of fantastic, just fantastic marketing. I mean, how could you, you know, high point, since the high point of it. But what's interesting is if you look in the close, you have a desk, you need a Macintosh. So beautifully done here. Of course, here's the comparison of the ugly world of the IBM PC and the beautiful world of the Mac. And down, but down here we have Bill Gates. Uh, he's saying, uh, uh, to create a new standard takes something that is just a little bit different. It takes something that's really new and captures people's imagination. Macintosh needs that standard. 
Of course, people don't realize that Apple was the largest software developer for the Mac. Interesting connections between these companies. Here's the hardware. This is what Clark Bell, Bob Delvo was in charge of shipping that package. Your, your share plan or your care plan. Now, here is an Apple business report inside Apple created on the banking phone. So, their business annual report for that year was done on the Mac. Makes sense, doesn't it? So, for 1984. Now, uh, here's something you probably wouldn't have seen before, the Apple employment application. Done on a regular piece of paper, so I guess sort of like a web form or something. You have to use a thing in your hand to fill it out. Yeah. Who's who in sales and operations, 1985. It's kind of interesting, the arteries and nervous systems of the company. The sales, the sales, the U.S. sales, different work charts, service engineering, service engineering modified a little bit. And the, what I thought was really interesting here was this article by Bill Joy about Unix, about the seashell, introduction to the seashell Unix, and that they're setting up an account for people at Apple to get into Unix or virtually Unix. This is sort of a, a shell is a man interpreter, etc. And I have obtained an account for you and Wayne uh, Mac 750, they're running version of Unix 4.2. And this is marketing to Apple's future being a Unix company, which it is now. And Tim, you're, you're almost through this tortuous uh, journey through documentary history. Uh, some other nifty and spiffy stuff, big and little, that we came across in the resource. So one of our bigger members of the uh, collection is the Craig Long Serial Number 34, uh, use of Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, the only Cray I, I'm sad to say that it's fully intact transformers, which means they're full of oil. They weigh, you know, each transformer weighs uh, six, seven hundred pounds. Ridiculous. So it's trying to move this and bolt, bolt this to the, uh, the, the tower plate to the major effort. If you get a crate, just for your career note, make sure the transformers are drained. <laughs> and they don't contain PCBs. We have a panel for about a week on that story. So with it came the this very thin manual, the crate computer system, a reference manual. You buy a $20 million machine, you get a little manual like this, I suppose. So here's a, this is really a production to it, but last year an enormous box came of crate memory. Over 45 coffee mugs and some of these awards, which are just beautiful blue side awards. So, for somebody who worked at Craig for a long time, coffee mug. Uh, one of the other big systems in the collection is this analog machine, a TR48 by EAI associates. Uh, and of course, the programming interface is there, you catch cord, you mount it on those times. Those uh, contacts and then you set your attenuators. It's maybe one of the larger analog machines ever made. And the TR48, we sent all these dogs off to Toronto where they're restoring one of these on the scan. That's why I have some of them. This, this is your typical interfaces on an analog system. And this is some of the other things that came very few mainframe things in our collection. Of System 378 plate, and I said that's it. We're not collecting the largest but in the space. But some of the documentation is great. Here's a 7094 uh, back in the day. This is why I don't collect them. Now, this is fascinating. You heard about the, the lease that I'm going from the big floppies to the three and a half inch floppies. This is really a positioning paper titled. Why the three and a half inch micro floppy will be the next industry standard. Pretty interesting to find this because it, it did. It did become the next industry Here is the position paper, January of 84. And of course, the Mac had it. This sort of arguments about uh, micro floppies. This is called a micro floppy as opposed to a floppy. Now, this is really interesting also from Bob Delva. I pulled this out. This, this is interesting. It's PowerPoint. Oh, it's four thought systems. This is becoming actually created PowerPoint. And it's my first confidence. And the, the, the books were, this is a fantastic art-bound book for the first PowerPoint. 
tomorrow is like one place. They really need to be digitally captured. So now Steve's been doing some of that on, in his spare time, but you know now that the documents are known, they're placed. Uh, we know where the rare things are. We know what is valuable. Like that complete collection of, of mints documents needs to be scanned in, for example. Uh, please let me know because you know, as a responsible collector, these things are fragile. They need to be put in the public domain. Uh, I'm also trying to build kind of the Leary's collection. I have his archive of his books, remaining books. I was the agent for his family, his trust. We placed the manuscript collection at the New York Public Library. They did not want his books, his records, and the news archives. So I've got a quarter million artifacts that I've got to get scanned of Tim Leary's. I'm trying to raise money for that, for the Internet Archive to do the clippings, because they can do it on their book scanner. So they need about 20, raise about 20 grand for employee time alone to get Tim's news archives. So I've got to deal with these two collections. <laughs> Anybody have any ideas? Let me know. So that's it for DigiBar in 2016. And if there's any questions, please uh, raise your hand. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if somebody comes to you with something you don't want, who do you send it to? Uh, I got a little thing. Um, I don't want it. I usually hopefully get it off so it doesn't get shipped or brought over. But I actually have a room full of things that did come in. That if somebody drives <coughs> six boxes over, you just have to take them all. Uh, so I have a room full of things that I'm completely willing to let go you know, and that I keep. And I'm planning to actually publish page of that, so if anybody wants to do that, they can get on You can come down and take whatever you want to do. Questions in the back? Physical objects themselves, like desertification or humidity control. 